May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Christ is risen indeed, indeed, alleluia. <laughs> and here we are with our brother Thomas. We all know Thomas. We love Thomas. At least I know I do. I love him when I'm reminded that I can be like him. I don't love him as much when I'm also reminded that I can be like him. <laughs> because this beautiful man of God is the doubtful, even non-believer, who hides out inside of me and I believe each and every believing Christian. He is the one who can question the one that can resist, thankfully, easy answers, especially to the hard questions of faith. Thomas is the one that wants just a little more proof. Over our history of Christian theology, there have been multiple accounts of study and thought around this idea of why Thomas doubts. And in each error or school of thought, there is provided its own reflection on this disciple's behavior. In the early church, the doubters possibly questioned whether God as eternal or divine. Could God actually die and still be God? And Thomas seemed to bear the weight of those Trinitarian debates. Later, medieval scholarship depicted Thomas's doubt in a more logical way, putting in his mouth the question, is resurrection metaphysically or analytically ineligible? That's a tongue twister. For the more mystically oriented, doubt is described as the dark night of the soul. In the midst of unbelief and doubt, belief can actually grow in the shadows. And then more recently, the Enlightenment. Ah, uh, the Enlightenment theologians used rational, empirical arguments to craft their brand of Thomas's doubt. The question they asked, who has actually seen the dead rise? And in doing so, they turned the resurrection Christ into a symbol of a philosophical preference for the future. Now I know there was a whole lot, of my, whole lot more dialogue and ideas and those were just the highlights of what I have kind of wrapped my arms around of the history of this idea of doubt. It is definitely experiencing some sort of doubt that I know is a very human thing to do. Even when we realize that even though we have a solid relationship with the God of our understanding, even though we faithfully attend church, say our prayers, read and study scripture, guess what? We can still experience or have doubts or unsettled thoughts and feelings about what we either were taught to believe or came to believe on our own. It is just very human. I mean, there are a whole list of questions that can stir up a lot of thought or struggle either within ourselves or in a small group discussion. And there are some questions that can definitely get a coffee hour conversation <laughs> or a book study conversation up and going. You know, a biggie, can God die? That's definitely a big one. But is it that far-fetched as we reflect this first Sunday after the Easter resurrection? I mean, we can have many questions about the mysteries of our faith and a variety of questions, you know. The questions around the stuff that we just don't have some kind of proof for. You know, that specific answer, very black and white, neatly tied in a bow. 
the parts of our faith that we can't necessarily reach out and touch is another place that doubt can creep in. And in the midst of all of these kinds of questions and unsettled thinking, I believe we're given an answer to this doubt. An answer that we can find in John's story today. An answer that reflects on who Jesus is, not who Thomas is. It is here in this story that I believe we find the real point, one of the many, but for today, the real point of the gospel narrative. It is a beautiful story about God coming to us wherever we may be and whatever the obstacle might be. The answer in John's gospel believe, begins at the door that we hear about at the start of this story. Instead of depicting Jesus, a risen Christ, as one who opens the door, we are told that Jesus walks right up to Thomas. Let me pause. I got out of order here. Instead of this story depicting a risen Christ who opens the door, walks up to Thomas, and then starts to argue or persuade with him, trying to turn his answer inside out or argue against it, John's gospel paints this very different picture. It tells us so much about the unique character and the blessing and grace of resurrection faith and its relationship with doubt. You see, first, John's gospel tells us that Jesus walks through a closed door. Jesus walks through a closed and locked door to get to Thomas. It's now a matter of Thomas's, it's not a matter of Thomas's doubt driving him to demand answers from Jesus. It is Jesus who is determined. Determined to reach this man of faith who is having doubt. Who is being skeptical about the way this newly revealed situation and who isn't letting anyone else in his group of friends convince him otherwise. Ever been there? It is Jesus who refuses to let a locked door, simple in its imagery, but an obstacle just the same. It is the risen Christ who moves through this door. It is the movement of love toward the one who lacks faith. And the same is true for us today. When doubt creeps in and crowds out hope, we can lean on the belief and hopefully eventually have a confidence that Jesus will come to meet us where we are. Even if it is somewhere out on the far edge of faith, that part of our faith that has forgotten how to believe. And if we're honest, we have those days. Or we have those seasons. I mean, what a strange and beautiful thing to hold on to or to think about. A belief or even a certainty. That's a tough word, but a belief that the answers to our most profound and desperate questions about life come about sometimes not because we seek them with this focused determination, but because God comes seeking us. Stepping through the walls that hardship can build around us, offering love at the very moment that grace seems to be nothing more than a ghost story. Even when we're told by friends that we've lived with and trust that we are honestly struggling to believe. John's Gospel also tells us that even though Jesus walks right up to Thomas, that those disciples that were present weren't really even quite sure of who he was when he first showed up. It is odd, isn't it, that Thomas doesn't jump up in shock the minute Jesus arrives? That might be easy for us to claim now, so far after all the original context and knowing the end of the story. It would also probably be 
shocking, particularly if Jesus looks like he did before his death. Their last image is of him on the cross. If he still has the same carpenter's hands, the road calloused feet, and the kind of smile that graced his face before the cross took him down, I do believe this tells us there is a good chance that when Jesus comes to find us and our doubt-filled wanderings, that we too, like Thomas, will not recognize him even when he is two inches from us. We find an answer in our gospel passage today. One answer at least that I invite you to reflect on. Other answers may speak to you in the weeks to come. But for me, as I sit with this text and as I sit with this question of resurrection and the question of seeing or knowing the risen Christ, even when it's two inches in front of my face, I hear answers in the way Jesus offers Thomas two clues to Jesus' identity. First, he speaks the simple words, peace be with you. Not once, not twice, but three times. And then he asks his doubtful friend to put his doubtful fingers into the wounds. The wounds that he bears from the nails and the swords that destroyed his body only days before, peace be with you, and please see and touch my wounds. I mean, what does this tell us about our faith? That question I leave with you. This, I believe, tells me and can tell us that when God comes, we will recognize God's presence in those moments when peace is offered. In those moments when life's most brutal violence is acknowledged and acknowledged honestly. And when in the midst of this brutal kind of honesty, we realize that we are not alone, but have been always already found. It is good news indeed, my brothers and sisters, that in the different seasons of our life, Jesus has and will continue to appear in different ways. The appearance will change, and we will not always know him in the moment, particularly when struggles, hardships, or pain give us many reasons to doubt. After all, we are human, and during these seasons of life, in any one moment, the risen Christ may come to us dressed in golden garb, calling us to celebrate with the joy of the richness of this spirit-filled faith promises, only for the next time to show up wearing beggar's rags, reminding us the love which saves is vulnerable and costly and that the glory which awaits us is humble in texture and very well worn in the feel of it. And still, even at another time, the risen Christ may come to us wrapped in this very soft wool wrap of the wise grandmother who simply holds us as we weep. So whatever appearance the risen Christ may show up, for you or for us in community, whether it is revealed inside golden robes, street faded rags, or a warm knitted scarf or sweater. We won't find, we just won't find a logically argued response more times than not to our questioning faith, but instead a surprising proclamation of peace and touching love that is stronger than even violent death itself. It is in the wonder of these wounds, of our wounds, of Christ's wounds, that Christ finds us. 
Amen.